Welcome to the Scaling Japan podcast, a podcast about how to grow your business from one hundred thousand dollars and beyond. And beyond in the land of the rising sun. Welcome to the Scaling Japan podcast. I'm your host Tyson Batino, and on today's show is Bo Becker. Bo is the CEO of Reiwa Pharmaceuticals in Japan. He has more than 10 years of professional experience working in Asia, and has worked on multiple sales teams for traditional mid-sized Japanese corporations. He has a lot of solid experience doing sales and customer relationship management in Japan as a Westerner, and Bo is going to share a lot of his tips and advice. On how to do sales in Japan to traditional Japanese companies, but also give a lot of insight into the thought process and what goes on in a traditional Japanese company as well to help you with your sales to traditional Japanese companies. So, Bo, glad to have you on the show, and please introduce yourself. Well, thank you very much for having me, Tyson. And let me say that I've very much been looking forward to this conversation since you first pitched the idea to me. As you mentioned, I run Reiwa Pharmaceuticals, a startup here in Tokyo, and we are on a mission to bring anti-flush products to Japan. So, specifically, what we make is a small functional beverage named Akan, which is targeted at. 42% of Japanese people that have a genetic DNA deficiency,、uh, which causes them to turn red and have many negative reactions after drinking alcohol. So we are on a mission to give them a more healthy and fun way to enjoy drinking. I think your product name, the branding, the name of the company is genius level stuff. <laughs> well, we put a, we put a lot of work into that. It turned out to be kind of a way to get around some regulations. Was to have a catchy name that told the users exactly what the product did without stating it directly. Yeah, I mean that's what I'm doing currently. But what I'm really hoping to share today is my unique career. And why I say that is that for most of my career, I've been working for mid-sized, very traditional Japanese machinery companies. And in most of those situations, I was the only、uh, non-Japanese on the sales team, and basically from day one, it was culture shock every day. Me outside of my comfort zone, and just accumulating as many lessons and insights into Japanese business culture as possible. So,、uh, hoping to share that with anyone listening today. Just to go back on a quick introduction. My first interest in you know, Japan and、uh, Asia in general came from my time in university. I had an amazing opportunity to do an internship in Beijing, and traveled to Tokyo for a number of exhibitions, and really quickly fell in love with the business culture and knew that I wanted to make my career related to both Chinese and Japanese business culture going forward. And so I ended up spending five years studying and working in China, and five years working professionally in Osaka and Tokyo, Japan. In terms of the sales teams I was part of, I had such a great experience because I was on one side managing the Japanese、uh, domestic customers, and that would be you know, large and medium-sized. Customers for their domestic factories, but even more so the Japanese-owned factories all around the world, which I was visiting. On the other side, I was also representing the Japanese company I was working for to the you know, small to large corporations around the world. So it, it was an amazing opportunity to learn as much as possible as I could about this. Wow, that's really awesome, and I think it's very impressive that they had that much trust in you to even manage the Japanese clients as well. So that <laughs> shows a lot. Well, it didn't start from day one, but slowly but surely, I was able to gain their trust and get into some of these really cool meetings. So one reason I really wanted to get Bo on the podcast is 
So actually, Bo, he's not a man in his 50s. And if you <laughs> listen to a lot of podcasts that talks about sales in Japan, it's usually with older gentlemen. But uh, no, Bo is a young, very handsome man, his early 30s. And he's had to sell big products, big services as a person in his 20s. And I think he can share a lot of insights for the listeners that maybe they might not be a country manager. They might not have、uh, 20 years in Japan.、Mm-hmm. And you have to start from zero. And how do you go about doing that? So I think this will be、uh, very interesting for the listeners, especially those in the startup space. I think you told me something interesting before, but that sales teams are often the main driver of Japanese corporations. Yeah, absolutely. And so when we compare these, you know, especially mid sized, but, but also large Japanese corporations to a typical, what we could call Western corporation, what really stuck out to me was that there's this interesting internal push and pull, one side being the sales team. And the other side being the manufacturing, or if it's not a machinery company, I would say the development team. And I found that in, in every situation, there would be a sales bucho or sales director, and on the other side, a manufacturing director who were always pushing and pulling each other to say which direction the company should go. And then the actual shacho or CEO would listen to both of them. But my experience, what I hear from other salesmen who've worked in Japan, is that at least nine times out of 10, the company will be moving in the direction that the sales team wants to go. No matter what types of new products the manufacturing or development team comes up with, it always seems that the sales teams. Preferred direction and where they think that the company should go wins out in the end. That makes perfect sense. And I think that probably the concept of a product manager isn't as common in Japan. Yeah, this is a very interesting business culture that is very prevalent in Japanese companies. But if we think of a typical business team, sales team in a Western company, usually have a account manager. And then a direct salesman to do the negotiations. After that, it gets passed on to some type of internal manager who's handling it going through the company. You'd have a whole team for each customer. It's quite a different mentality in Japanese corporations. And I do think this directly reflects how important the direct relationship between. The salesman and the, and the、um, customer is to Japanese corporations because a Japanese salesman really has to work as an entire account manager for each customer. And so they will first have to approach and do negotiations, get the sale. But even after the contract is signed, Salesmen in a Japanese company are expected to micromanage that project through the company, could be manufacturing, could be development, whatever it is, until the very end. And you know, it even gets to the point where if the、uh, final bill is not paid, then the、uh, finance team is going to be looking at the salesmen to take care of that as well. So I found that the sales team is much more of full account managers. I would even say that they are the voice of their customers within, the, within their corporation. And sometimes you'll have the, the sales team with each of them having their respective customers. And it's quite odd. You might think that, of course, the company wants as many customers as possible. But what I've seen happen many times is that if the manufacturing team or the development team thinks they cannot handle that much workflow, that the salesmen will almost have to fight with each other for their customer to get taken or have priority when the company is deciding which customer to go with. I guess it does make sense. I mean, the company has、uh, limited resources to add new features. Uh, yeah, give special、absolutely. attention to clients, and so, and I know the salesmen,、uh, they like to over promise or、mm-hmm. they don't actually are involved with making the product, so they make promises that are hard to keep. So, I guess <laughs> I can imagine probably some intense internal battles, yeah, absolutely. And I, I guess the last point that I wanted to bring up on this general topic. Was one that kind of took me quite a while to wrap my head around it. I realized that commissions 
which are so prevalent in any typical sales team, are usually seen as quite a negative incentive within Japanese corporations. And so for the sales teams that I was a part of, there was absolutely no commissions at all. And they were very adamant about staying away from that type of model. We would get like a small team bonus if we met a monthly goal. And by small, it was something like 20,000 yen per month per person, which is you know not much at all. But it's quite an interesting approach they take to sales because they definitely do not like to incentivize salesmen financially, but rather expect them to show loyalty to the company through paying a, a relatively high direct salary. Yeah, I'm curious if this applies to tech companies. A couple other guests who are going to talk about the tech mm -hmm. side, and I'll probably follow up with them on that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and really what I'm talking about is a traditional attitude towards sales in Japan. And I, I can assure you that any traditional manager definitely knows about this culture and would may not be that comfortable giving a commission. So I, it just if you are dealing with you know, Japanese salesmen or imagining what you're coming up with, be aware that they're likely not getting a commission at all for any type of sales they take care of. And I thought the point you also mentioned about the sales person being expected to be the account manager mm -hmm. was another really interesting point to mention. And I think with some of the with businesses that I've seen in Japan, especially smaller businesses, I think it's always been a tough transition where uh, the owner or the CEO has always been the person doing the sales mm -hmm. and the clients are really attached to them and they're doing all these services. But when they want to grow the company, it, they kind of have to start passing some of those functions away. And it's kind of a hard transition. So I guess for uh, the listeners out there, when you hire salespeople or when you do uh, corporate sales, there is a bit of that expectation to be the account management as well. Oh, absolutely. And I would say any customer is expecting to deal with one person throughout the entire sales and delivery process. You know, from start to finish and even following up after that, what they're really hoping for is one confident, very well presented person to take care of them from start to finish. So I guess that makes sense. They can pay them a good salary because they want them to stay. Let's say having one person stay long term might actually be more effective than just someone who gets crazy amount of sales, possibly. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, absolutely. That's definitely the case. There was a point I wanted to bring up that many cases in Japanese corporations, the time that you spend in the office or your time that you spend meeting with customers is often more valuable or equally valuable to the results that you get, you know, financial results you get as a salesman. I definitely would agree with that. Most Japanese corporations are looking for a salesman that will stay with them for a long period of time rather than come in quickly and get them a bunch of results. And I think another question that I think is probably the approach might be different in Japan versus uh, let's say the US, but in your experience, when you met with a Japanese client, what would the first and second meeting be like? Sure. Just to compare with my experiences meeting with Western clients, is I, I would travel with some of our managers uh, around the world to visit customers. For example, we would go into a large American corporation's factory and we, we would come in, there would be no receptionist waiting. We would spend 10 minutes just trying to find somebody to go get the person we were meeting with. We Finally, we'd get to a room. There would be no refreshments at all. And they would say, they would say oh, we got to get the meeting over quick. We've got other things to do and be pushing us out of the door even after an hour. Whereas every time we would meet with a Japanese customer, whether it was in Japan or at one of their factories abroad, the response was always extremely hospitable. Hey, it was always a pleasure. We would come, we, the receptionist would always meet us, take us to a, a private room for a meeting that was you know, ready to go with nice refreshments and would sit down with the potential customers. It would never be direct to business. Always be at least 15 minutes, if not more, of talking about how is this operation going? What kind of projects are you working on? You know, even how are your families? 
even introductions of the people present. And it, it was always very nice. I would say for the first meeting, we, it would be at least 15 minutes before we even got to business. From my perception, the longer you can draw out a first or second meeting, the more chance of su success you're going to have. So I do think there is a, some kind of relationship between the emotional connection, you know, slowly build with the customers and how successful you're going to be with them. Yeah, well, a first meeting needs to be as long as possible. Yeah, and I remember uh, from my experience, I think, let's say the more you go into like just personal chit chat, it does have a positive effect. And I remember like cases where the companies that we really had a good relationship, it would be like after 20, 25 minutes, we're like, oh, shouldn't we be having a meeting? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I haven't mentioned him yet, but my great mentor, who was my boss in my previous company, Mr. Ando, I mean, he would sit there and talk with any managers. He would go for 30 minutes before we even mentioned uh, the business. And often he would tell me that you should try to avoid talking about business until dinner. That you should, if possible, you can just go the entire first meeting without talking business and then take them to dinner and talk about business there. And obviously, that's not always going to be the case. As I said, your goal should be to get the meeting as long as possible for the first and second meetings. So I guess for the second, could you give us, I guess, the first meeting, 15 to 30 minutes, kind of getting to know each other. Uh, in the mm -hmm. second meeting, like how much time would you spend getting to know each other? I would say just as much. I wouldn't call it getting to know each other. But instead of talking about the direct business deal that you are there to talk about, I would say talk about what challenges are there you know, are they facing in, in their company, what type of you know, future projects they're looking forward to, and yeah, even talk about their internal company politics in a way. You know, ask them who's um, working where, if they've had any troubles with new factories or new locations, you know, just the, these types of similarly related business topics can be a, a great way to understand your customer better without uh, you know, asking about their personal family situation. So I do know a lot of foreigners, like a lot of them have really good Japanese skills, but they don't fit <laughs> into a Japanese corporation. Could you tell us more about like uh, how can a foreigner successfully fit in and maybe even get mentored or let's say, be liked by Japanese people? I got some great advice right after I joined uh, my, my first Japanese company in Osaka. And one Japanese manager who had been working at the company's factories abroad for many years told me, Bo, your goal is to be 50% Japanese and 50% yourself. You'll bring your own culture to the table. And I, I really found that that advice has taken me a long way. Just to give some examples of what I'm talking about, I'm, no Japanese company is going to hire you to act as Japanese as possible. That's definitely not what they're looking for. But at the, on the other side, they definitely want someone who fits into the culture. I do try to fit in as much as possible. But on the other side, for example, you know, for my family, Christmas is very important. And every year I, I visit my family for Christmas. And so whenever I come back in January, if I meet with customers or even within the company, I'll be telling everyone about Christmas and showing pictures of my family, talking about <laughs> these experiences they might not have. It goes over very well, especially with customers. I mean, they, they love to be exposed to these types of things. And another example is a, a very simple one that we come up against a lot in Japan, which is this culture of bowing rather than shaking hands. But I would say as a, as a foreigner doing business in Japan, you really need to embrace that 50% of your own culture. Yeah, in, in some cases, go ahead with the handshake, even though it's not the Japanese traditional thing to do. I think it does give you some sort of edge to be a little bit different. Uh, as long as you're staying within the culture generally. So, yeah, try to keep to that principle. 
Like what you're listening to and ready to scale your company? Let Tyson coach you and your team to make the jump. You can find more information about our coaching and advisory services at www.scalingyourcompany.com. Now, back to our podcast. So I guess if I was a company owner, you know, country manager, and a Japanese client was coming to visit the office, I would do the same. Like, let's say, making the customer feel welcome, giving them the snacks. You might even give them some foreign snacks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, bring some omiyage and,、uh, or, or small sweets from your home country. Yeah, I would be really cautious, maybe something not too sweet. So, I guess if, if you don't know what type of foreign sweets that Japanese like, probably just stick、you、to chocolate. You never go wrong with chocolate <laughs> in Japan. Trust me on that. Yeah, the, the second yeah. part of your question was about you know, how to get mentored in a Japanese company. I think that's a, a really interesting topic to touch on because anyone who's joined a Western corporation knows that from day one, you'll have at least one week, if not more, of training sessions, you know, one on ones with managers, and, and so on. But this really is not the way that it's going to work with any Japanese company. From day one, you may get left on your own to figure things out. And this really is because the Japanese business system has slowly evolved out of the traditional apprentice system, where whenever a new person came into a business, they were expected to be almost an apprentice of a manager and learn from them directly instead of getting a so called corporate training. In my case, I was actually originally hired by the manager of the Shanghai factory of my first company and then was immediately transferred to the Osaka headquarters. And so I got there, and the managers in Osaka were very nervous about you know, stepping on the toes of the person who had hired me and training me improperly, so to say. And so, for the first six months or so, I kind of got caught in a limbo where I was you know, waiting for someone to teach me and then no one was doing that. And what I realized is the key is that you've really got to attach yourself to one manager or you know, try to put yourself in an apprentice position when you join the company. Choose one manager that you think is going to teach you as much as possible. And really attach yourself to them, show up at all their meetings, make yourself available. And that's how you're going to get you know, accepted and mentored. Most of my listeners are like business owners and country managers. But、uh, kind of the reason I'm asking both these questions is sometimes you're going to have to work with someone in a Japanese company. Or you're gonna work with a foreign buyer in a Japanese company. Understanding these things, like you can kind of gauge if that foreigner has people listen to them or not.、Mm -hmm. And、uh, so when you do actually do sales to them, it'll help you gauge better if this is person's a decision maker or not, even、uh, if they're both foreign or Japanese. I know you've spoken to other foreigners who do sales in Japan and、uh, you give advice to other people. But、uh, what are some common misunderstandings or mistakes that foreigners in Japan make in regards to sales? Yeah, so, this is where the conversation gets really fun because I love to talk about these interesting cultural differences that, that I've been so fortunate to understand over the years. One thing that we observe a lot in, in Japanese business culture. Is the prevalence of keigo or polite speech. And anyone knows that you know, in, in business situations in Japan, you're expected to use certain speech which would make you seem more polite. The truth of the matter is that this keigo or polite speech is actually a method to increase the distance between yourself and whoever you're speaking to. And by distance, I mean to remove the friendly aspect you know, in a sense. So, when you're using polite speech, it would actually be with people you're less comfortable with. And how this relates to the sales situation is that whenever there was the first meeting, of course, we would be using more polite speech or in, in a phone call. But what I always saw was that the older managers of the Japanese company, maybe the people you'd expect to be using polite speech the most, would be the ones using it the least. And it always reflected 
how close and how good of a relationship we had with our customers, the less polite speech they were using. And my wonderful mentor, Mr. Ando, you know, he would be using the most casual speech of any when meeting with the largest Japanese corporations. And maybe they trusted him because of that. So the, the misunderstanding would be maybe you're meeting with a customer and they're being extremely polite, using a lot of polite speech, you might think that's a good indicator. But I would say the less polite speech and the more casual you can make the interaction, the better chance of success you're going to have. That was my first misunderstanding. And the second one I came up with is that you really cannot make a sale in Japan without reaching the decision maker directly. I find a lot of people doing their first sales in Japan, having a very polite, very positive meeting experience, maybe even a number of meetings with a mid-level manager. It seems like things are going well. I've found that in Japanese corporations, there's always a single decision maker, which is usually behind the scenes uh, and usually in a managerial role. And in any case, They've definitely been at the company for 20 plus years or so. Most of their career has been at the company. And your goal is really to reach that decision maker to make the sale. And some advice on how to do that would be, first, I would say, go to an exhibition where the company has a booth out and walk directly to the most senior people at the company. Find the decision maker and go get their business card. Based on your experience, like just glancing at the team, uh, what are some tips on picking out the decision maker? Yeah, okay. So they will not be the person standing on the edge of the booth or something like that. They will not be the aggressive salesperson. They will be kind of hanging out around the back, observing the other people working uh, is usually what they look like. They'll definitely be very well dressed, could be male or female. I've definitely met some top female managers in Japan, though, though most of them are, are male. But um, yeah, I would go with that. The, the person that looks like a manager and is kind of watching everyone else. Awesome. That's a good tip. Yeah, so and the, the second quick tip for getting to the decision maker is if you're doing cold or warm calls for sales purposes, go online before you make the call and find the name of a manager or you know, hopefully a decision maker. Find their name and ask for them directly. I've had it many times where I've cold called a company and asked for the director by name and they'll connect me to them. I've heard from somewhere, like I haven't done it personally, but like you just call and actually ask for them by son instead of calling them the traditional Sama to show okay. that you actually know the person. Oh, that's a I great heard. tip. But when you've kind of called places and asked for the person directly, I guess any tips to help us increase our odds of actually getting through? Well, one would be to name their department. Uh, like when you call, first you give a quick introduction to your company. But I, I like what you said about saying son. It's, it goes back to what I had just mentioned about in many cases, the more casual, the better. Just naming your company and asking for their department and the person you'd like to speak to. Cool. Thanks for that. Any other common misunderstandings? Yeah. So the last misunderstanding I came up with, I call it the smaller the partner, the better. And so I meet a lot of people who come to Japan and think that their best chance is to get a gigantic contract with SoftBank or Rakuten or whoever it is. But my personal experience has been that the larger the Japanese corporation, the more bogged down with bureaucracy and the harder the decision maker is to find. Whereas mid-sized companies, and especially in Japan's current economic environment, are oftentimes desperate for a leg up or a new idea or a new customer. They're really reaching out trying to find one. So I would suggest anyone doing their, their first sales in Japan to forget about the gigantic corporations for a while and go for the mid-size or even small customer. I think you'll get a much better reception and the time from initial meeting to sale will be greatly reduced. 
I think that's excellent feedback for a lot of foreign businesses in Japan. The main reason being it, I think if you've been in Japan for 20, 30 years, you've worked corporate, you have a lot of corporate connections, you can take the short track and go directly to the corporations. But as someone who's unproven in Japan, and let's say you don't have a lot of Japanese clients that are the high pedigree clients, mm -hmm. a lot of companies will probably say like, oh, come back when you get more clients. That's definitely happened before. Awesome. And uh, yeah, so I know you have a lot of tips for us on how to do sales, but uh, do you have any other tips for foreigners doing sales in Japan specifically? Yeah, absolutely. Let's jump into those. So one thing that always sticks out to me is that an exaggeration of politeness can really make a good impression. I mean, even to the point where it feels very fake. And so some quick examples would be that whenever I write an email to a Japanese company, especially when it's a sales pitch, you start with a number of thanks, profusely thanking them for whatever has happened. And you might even do two or three thank yous before getting to the uh, actual content of the email. And there's lots of other examples like walking somebody out of the factory, out of the office and bowing as they drive away walking someone to the train station near your office, you know, all of these small gestures of politeness that may seem very fake and unnecessary in our cultures are really the basis of Japanese business culture. And if you're not doing that, you're going to be perceived negatively, even if they don't say that. So I would say, you know, lean into it. Go for being too polite. Thank them profusely for you know even silly small things and totally lean into it. So maybe a good analogy to use is maybe if you're walking in the desert for like a, a day or two and someone <laughs> finally gives you water, the way you speak to that person is the way you should maybe speak and think about the client. That sounds like a great way to think about it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely. Uh -huh. That's one tip I have. And another one is to you know, work on your printed materials and gifts. In Japanese business culture, gift giving is very prominent, giving a company gift or giving sweets, something like that. But w whenever I would go on a business trip, I would have company pamphlets. I would have the company calendars all printed out and every customer would get a whole pack of printed materials. And what I saw over years of meetings was that when I gave a sales presentation, you know, most American or European businessmen would be looking at me and the PowerPoint presentation while I spoke, whereas most Japanese businessmen would be looking at the printed material while I spoke. It was a very interesting difference. I would say that printed materials do make a difference. And we might expect many Western customers to just throw them away. But I have found that Japanese customers love to read them and that you should have a great pamphlet and hopefully a company calendar to give to any customer. I'm not sure if we do it anymore, but so the company I found, I would say, is a Japanese company. And we actually had a folder to put in the sales materials. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's even better. Or a bag. We would have a printed company bag to put it all in. Oh, uh, sorry. I meant like uh, we actually had a folder to store the sales pamphlets we got from other companies who tried to do sales. Oh, to sure. Us. Yeah. If we didn't have just a folder, I think there was like an entire filing cabinet just for those <laughs> uh, in, in my previous office. Absolutely. That's the, the second general tip I had. And the third one kind of goes back to something I said before, but don't rush the meetings. I really want to harp on that because you never want to be the one who's ending a meeting, especially when they come to your office or you know, even if you're visiting them. You want to make yourself as available as possible, very patient and available to answer any questions and talk about anything they might want to. And there's a kind of traditional Japanese culture point that I think is very interesting and applicable. And it's that the traditional way to be polite and ask somebody to leave from a meeting or from your house is to ask them if they would like more tea. 
And so you can imagine, you know, you've got your teacup and you finished it. And if they don't want you to leave, they'll keep filling it up without asking. But at that point where you've worn out your welcome, they will actually ask, would you like some more? And that's your indication to leave. That cultural point does go along with this idea that you should take the meeting slow, have a lot of small talk and genuinely try to understand the environment in their company and what they're going through and try to make the meetings as long as possible. And for the listeners, I think one important point to mention is that there are definitely exceptions to these rules. Uh, you probably have Japanese friends yourself. And so I think a lot of these tips are really useful when you're dealing with Japanese companies who are not used to dealing with foreigners or the person you're dealing with has not lived overseas, may not be fluent in English. Just wanted to clarify to everyone that depending on the other person, not all of these apply. Oh, sure. These are general tips on how to make your sales meetings in Japan more effective. Excellent. Yes, I, I mentioned this at the beginning. I know you did a lot of sales in your late 20s and early 30s, but as a person who's not in their 50s with 20 years experience in Japan, how do you get credibility? Whenever you finally meet the decision maker, they're definitely going to be someone who's been in their respective company for you know, most likely 20 plus years. So you're going to be dealing with older professionals. But I was so lucky to have an amazing mentor while I was learning about this business culture. You know, my previous boss, Mr. Ando, who was an amazing salesman, he always told me that if you want to gain the trust of the customer, no matter who you are, you have to meet face to face or at least call. He would never send emails or that stuff. He would always have the customers on speed dial and he would call them whenever he needed to talk. He really pushed that into the sales team. And I completely agree with that because no matter how you want to look at it, interacting online does leave out some of that human emotion and connection that's required for building a good relationship. So I would say the first step is to spend that extra money or spend that extra time to get yourself to the customer's office and make sure that you're there to talk to them. And so that's the first tip. You know, always meet face to face or at least call. And the second one is that appearance really is important in the Japanese sales sense. You know, what I'm talking about by appearance is that, for example, I would often be meeting with factory managers for my previous job at the machinery company. And if I knew I was going on a business trip, I would start growing my beard a week before so that I would look older and look like I was someone who would be working in a factory to put them on their level. And I would never wear a suit when I was meeting with a factory manager. But on the other side, if I knew I was going to be meeting with a more traditional businessman, I would have to have a suit, really trying to be, you know, look as sharp as possible, always wearing a tie. And not just the clothes, but having a fancy business card holder or a nice bag. And I do think these small appearance points are very heavily valued by Japanese businessmen. I would encourage anyone to make sure that their personal appearance stands out in a sense. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. It uh, makes perfect sense in that it's really hard to get to know someone and trust someone that you've never met in person. Yeah, absolutely. And there was an amazing factory owner. I was not working for him, but he was one of our customers. But I had such a great relationship and he was so kind to teach me. At one point, he told me, he said, Bo, I've never made a major sale to a customer that hasn't visited my factory. And that really stuck with me because he was telling me how important it was for face-to-face -face meetings. It stuck with me to this day. I really believe that if you want to increase your sales chances or just your ability of building a confident relationship, you've got to be there in person. For example, if they're dealing with maybe a corporate client and if the corporation doesn't even come down to visit them, they get the impression that they're actually not very important when there's a big problem or they might have some big need, 
they don't have that personal connection leverage with that corporation. Let's say to prioritize the company or to get the job for the company. But if they're dealing with this one person, they've dealt with them for 10, 15 years. The person has in the past gotten things done when they needed help. Sure. And continue working with that person. But even more simply put, I really believe in the importance of putting a voice or a face to a name. And even, you know, if you can't be there in person, don't email them, just call. And I'm telling you, it, it makes a huge difference when whoever you're dealing with can put that voice to the name in their head rather than just reading what you've written on an email. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I know you're very lucky in that you had a very experienced salesperson take you under their wing. I think it was uh, Ando-san. Can you share some of the lessons you learned from him? Yeah, what an amazing dude. Mr. Ando was uh, really a, a wild guy. But just to paint the picture, I mean, we would be meeting with especially Japanese customers all around the world. And wherever we went with our team, I mean, the first question any manager of our customers would ask would be, oh, how's Mr. Ando? Is he doing okay? <laughs> how's his family? Was, oh, my God. I mean, he was just such a popular guy. Some lessons that he really instilled in me was, one, to be always looking for partners, not customers, especially with Japanese companies. And it was amazing because he would walk into a completely new customer, you know, someone that was expecting us to sell to them. And from the first minute, he would never say sales. He would say kyoryoku, which means collaboration. The whole pitch would be, we're going to be providing this for you so we can make a collaboration. The reality was that we were selling machinery for them to use, but it was always making a partner, collaborating together. And he would always teach me that you've got to put your own company on the same level as your customer. Never be a supplier, be a partner. And so I thought this was a great business lesson. I really do believe that, as I mentioned before, the decision makers in Japanese corporations have typically been at their companies for 20 plus years or sometimes even longer. And when you've worked at a one corporation for that long, you're usually looking for a long-term partner, someone that's going to work with you. I really believe that this looking for partners and putting your business on the same level as your customers really does make a difference. Uh, excellent. Uh, any other lessons I learned from Ando-san? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, one more to share was about the people relationship because he very much valued meeting in person, but he would always want to schedule a dinner with the customer, no matter where it was. And I would see him in his office the day before or whenever drawing out the seating arrangements for the dinner because he... <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was really amazing. Sometimes he would ask advice. He'd be like, oh, Bo, who do you think this lady should be next to or this one? He would always be thinking about who should this person be next to? How can I maximize this dinner? How can I make sure that so-and-so makes an impression on this person? Because he knew the value of that couple hours that we had together. And not, not even just for the dinners, also for the meetings. I would say really try to maximize every in-person meeting by thinking critically about who's going to be there and how you can uh, maximize each of those interactions. I think those are some solid tips. Uh, the one that really stuck with me was even if you are a supplier, when you talk with the client, frame it in terms of a partnership. Yeah, always do that. And the key word was kyoryoku. I mean, Mr. That was Mr. Ando's favorite word. I mean, he would say it all the time and he would go through a one hour sales meeting without ever mentioning sales. He would just talk about collaborations the entire time and how working together, we were going to make a brighter future for both companies. <laughs> and still a special man and I, I learned so much from him. For the audience, kyoryoku means collaboration yeah, and collaboration. also uh, cooperation. Sure. Yeah. Just working together. Thank you for sharing so much uh, tips. 
especially as a foreigner in Japan, I think it's sometimes easier to sell to, you know, foreign companies or companies that are used to dealing with foreigners. But if you're in something like a real traditional industry, like beverage and machines, factories, understanding how to do sales, like to a traditional Japanese company, I think will be really useful to the audience. Thank you very much for that. And yeah, in return for, you know, sharing so much wealth of knowledge with us, uh, do you have any asks or requests to the <laughs> audience? Well, the first thing to say is just that anyone listening is more than welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn. I, I'm very happy to continue the conversation and, and share as much experience as I can with anyone struggling or who wants to add to what I've said today. So you know, please reach out. The one ask I would have is that I run Reiwa Pharmaceuticals here in Tokyo. And as I said, we make anti-flush products for Japanese people affected by what's commonly known as Asian flush or Asian glow. And if you have any friends here in Japan that turn red after drinking alcohol, show them our website, show them our product. It would really help us in growing the brand. Thank you very much. And we're going to link to your Instagram and also your web page as well. And uh, for those who do speak Japanese, the name of the product is Akan from Reiwa Pharmaceuticals. And if you understand Japanese, I think you'll get uh, the clever pun. Thank you so much, Bo. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Tyson.